we go, record that. That's all recording now. So welcome, Mark, and welcome, Karen. And we're really all looking forward to your uh, webinar on the adult learner. Anybody with any questions, just pop them in that chat box and I will be back to ask Karen and Mark the questions later on. But at the moment, I'm just going to hand over to you two. OK, thank you, Sally. So hello Curious Piano Teachers and um, we're absolutely delighted to be with you today, aren't we Mark? Yeah, absolutely. It's great. Good, good fun so far. We've managed to get all hooked up. Yeah, we have. We have. So the adult learner, it's a very different thing, isn't it, teaching adults, Mark? And we've, we've, we've sort of, with our new books, we've been thinking about the adult learner quite extensively, but we also want to talk here about sort of general things, you know, right from beginner stages up to more advanced. Um, and I think the first thing to talk about is, you know, how the adult learner is different and, you know, how we need to uh, adjust our approach approach to that um, and I know myself and Mark have had a number of discussions about this that an adult learner has specific expectations about what they're coming to the piano for wouldn't you say so Mark? Yeah absolutely I think what I've, probably the most important thing to bear in mind about an adult learner um, is that they've decided for themselves that they're going to have the lessons so there's there's no risk of it being um, you sort of carrying the, the ambitions of somebody else, you're, you're carrying your own ambitions. So that's, that may be true also of a, of a youngster coming to you for a lesson, yeah. but we can be absolutely sure that it's true of the adult. So that's a kind of, that, that's quite a pivotal uh, starting point. And then you've got the fact that adults are not outsized children, if you like. They're not just small children who are behaving in a, in a physically bigger way. Their mentality is different. Their expectations, as you say, Karen, are, are very different, but also um, the pace of delivery and, and the, their willingness to indulge in theoretical matters beyond the practical skills that they might currently have um, will be very different from a youngster. Yeah, I think, I think it's really important, isn't it, Mark, that from the onset, to find out from the adult learner what they're looking for mm. and 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 also to check you know whether you are going to be delivered to deliver that expectation mm. because um i know i've had colleagues in the past that have spoken to me about an adult's come and they've just said mm. i only want to learn to play this piece of music mm. um and and so actually having from the onset you know uh, an idea that that sort of important consultation meeting about you know what they're looking for and making sure that you're the right match as well mm, absolutely yeah because simply because you're an experienced teacher yourself and you have before you an adult learner um, doesn't mean that you're going to be a good fit as a pair um, and given that you're going to be spending probably longer times because the average adult is going to have a longer lesson I would imagine than the average child's going to have quite a lot of my adults uh, might have two hour lessons. So it's pretty important that you're going to be able to share a space with them for two yeah. hours um, and not get on each other's nerves. You know, you've, you've got to be able to um, enjoy each other's company as well as each other's musical uh, points of view on things. So that's quite an important starting point, isn't it? Yeah. You know, so, I mean, having, I think having a, an initial consultation meeting, which is not actually in the room with the piano, so that you're not kind of engaged in the learning process yet. You're still kind of doing some exploratory stuff with them. It's a really important thing to have. Maybe even meeting on a mutual ground, meet, meet in a coffee shop and just have a casual chat about what the expectations of this, this person um, yeah. actually are um, and whether or not you think you're actually going to be able to, to fulfil that role. If you find yourself having that conversation in the room with the piano, then in a sense you kind of you're already in the flow it's quite difficult to disentangle yourself from that so i'd suggest that's a nice little way of, of getting the thing off off to a good start yeah i think the other thing to remember with adults is that they're putting themselves in a very vulnerable position mm -hmm. as well in the fact that you know if they're a complete beginner they're doing something 
that you know they've never done before or if they're coming back to the piano which I have quite frequently and I'll never forget and um, the lovely Sue who'd taken a grade five in 1954 and then <laughs> and was coming back to the piano um, and they they they're very vulnerable and also they're completely aware some of them of of what they are actually able to do and not able to do not all of them but some of them are overly critical of themselves aren't they mark yeah absolutely but I, mean, I think it's really important that we think about each of these people as individuals you know just yeah. as we work with children um you know adults are not a collective group of people who have a particular mindset any more than children are no and, and so we have to be able to value and recognize what it is about each individual that's going to be what you're hoping to nurture um, and so rather than starting with the expectation you're an adult i now teach you on this level yeah. you're an adult but you're also a particular individual with a very specific set of expectations and abilities some of which you recognize in yourself some perhaps you don't um, and we need to therefore carve out the kind of um, negotiation space that lies between us in order to make the whole thing a, a fruitful sort of exercise really because if you get the thing off to a bad start i think rather like driving lessons or anything else um, I've had some golfing lessons with people that I haven't kind of fully, if you like, negotiated the starting point with. And, and you always play and catch up from that point onwards. You know, you win. Yeah. In, in the chat, somebody was asking about flexibility. I think that does have to be flexibility, but I think there also has to be boundaries around that. Mm. Because what I found is if I've been too flexible, we've kind of gone around in a circle. With, with the adult learner and and you know I, I think that the the issue is that they actually we still are the expert and um, they may well not know what they are looking for um, until we, they've had more experience of lessons with us um, and and you know boundaries are very important because I know both of us have discussed that, you know, we've become almost a bit like therapists, you know, and, and, and that the, you know, keeping it actually on the piano and, um, and about the piano, um, it is really, really important. Mm -hmm. Um, so with my particular adult learners at the moment, um, we, I, I discuss the structure of the lesson and how they want it to be structured. So, um, and the structure's different for each of them, um, but one in particular, she's an adult returner. Um, we have, um, it's a, a 45 minute lesson and we have so much time on repertoire. We have so much time on the th filling in the gap theory elements that she's never understood from childhood. Um, and then we have another um, period where I expose her to new repertoire that I think, you know, will motivate and excite. And so that's just, um, you know, the structure that works for her. Um, what would you, would anything you'd like to add on that, Mark? Well, I don't know. I think that, I think with the structure, um, it's, it's a good idea to have, the some sort of methodology for, for how you're going to cover your lessons uh, that is ag agreed with the with the the pupil but without being too fixed into that yeah totally i think there comes a point where um the tail wags the dog you know you end yeah. up in a situation where instead of being able to adapt on the fly and become a good responsive teacher you're too eagerly looking down your list of things that you think you ought to be covering as a responsible teacher I think with, with yeah. adults, um, you need to be able to and be willing to go off at tangents to some sort of extent, um, you know, because yeah. adults will be more voluble. They will have more opinions uh, and they will want us to, to consume a greater amount of the time um, talking about the actual issues. Yeah. I mean, children can be very chatty and very, very involved as well, but they'll often go off topic um, in, in, a, in a slightly different way. I think with adults, you you do find that the tangential aspects of what you're teaching are always there and yeah. there's, no, there's no point in trying to pretend they're not um, and I'm, I'm going to get through these 10 things today on the, in this lesson because you yeah. might go through three 
yeah you know, totally. they're paying the money for this lesson and to an extent they're entitled to set the the, the course for how it's going to run it's their time isn't it mm. and you know um and when they arrive with different music that they want to explore mm. i always say yes well let's go for it you know and 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 really actively encourage them to bring and for us to explore new material as well mm. Absolutely. I mean, the whole business of repertoire, I think, is a, is a whole topic that we could discuss in itself. The appropriateness of, of repertoire um, and the realisticness of, of, you know, of, of the ambitions of, of teachers. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it, it's not very long into the teaching process before you're going to have to actually address those sorts of issues, particularly yeah. when you've got adult learners who've, who've come to you with um, some sort of backstory of having learned pieces for a diploma which they've not passed for example oh yeah now now you're into the business of having to sort of um if you like skillfully renegotiate their future yeah. into whether to retake with different pieces if you're talking about a much much less advanced player their reasons for learning the instrument might well be because they want to play Rachmaninoff or they want to play jazz like Oscar Peterson. Um, <laughs> and and the, just because they've been motivated musically in these very valid ways to, because they love that music, doesn't mean that those are necessarily good starting points or even end points. No, no. Um, shall, we, shall we talk a little bit about beginner's material? Because yeah, we've sure. had a, a number of discussions about this. Mm. So obviously there's a full range of tutor books. There's some excellent material out there. Um, but I've actually come across some other things which um, I found very useful as well, particularly with the adult learner, yeah. um, to do with coordination and to do with reading the bass clef. Um, and I, you know, I, I get quite a lot of adult learners that will come, um, you know, they'll come with, uh, you know, they'll, they'll come and they've got sort of these coordinational um, issues, but they can read the treble clef really easily. So uh, what I have found a lot of success with is Microcosmos Book One by Bartok, which actually to begin with has um, things in similar motion. So the treble's the same as the bass, so that the student is, is reading the treble clef and, and naturally playing the right bass notes. Um, and and it, it works very well. Um, the other thing about it is that it helps with the coordination because there's a lot of, of bass clef reading and use. Um, and then he kind of moves it and he does quite a bit of contrary motion work, etc. So I have found that a particularly useful book. Mm. Yeah. You know. Um, another another one that I do use um, is um, it's actually some duets by Diabelli, um, Opus 149, his Melodic Studies, um, and again quite a lot in five finger position to to start with, um, but but they they've got some fabulous accompaniments that you know the the adult learner sort of. I, I found that my, my students really respond to that feeling of ensemble um, mm. and, and hearing a bigger sound um, and, and Diabelli, you know, beautiful, some of the beautiful writing in there. Um, so I've also found them helpful. Um, another one is, um, I know we've all seen Dozen a Day, um, but there, there is this, um, let's, Put that there it's it's a dozen a day all year round so it's the whole lot in one book um and i and i find that the adult likes having this sort of you know great big you know book there um you know in the early stages that um is you know is just in one place it's in one place now i know you you don't you work quite a lot away from tutor books actually as do I with adults too um what would you like to add about that Mark um well I, I think that the trouble with tutor books um in 
with with adults is that the the, the pace of delivery is yeah. going to be so different with adults yeah. I mean, I, of course there's a bandwidth with children uh, of different age groups just as there are um, with adults but I, I when i have tried to use them in the past with adult beginners i found that i'm either racing through nine pages at once yeah. or i'm sitting on the same page for two weeks um and the pace of it's really quite difficult to to get so perhaps a, an alternative way is to have some tutor books that you like but be able to be flexible and have things on your iPad, have printouts of things, handwritten scores, um, and things that you know work for you, and just bring those into the, into the yeah. lesson so that you, instead of it being um, a, a structure you feel hidebound by, yeah. um, it's just a starting point, you're leaping in and out all the time. I love the idea with duets, I mean, I make duets out of ordinary piano pieces. I spend a lot of my time either at the top of the piano or the bottom of the piano, putting in bass lines so that they can now actually get the sense of musically how these things fit together. Because coordination isn't just about the problem of getting the second finger in the, in the right hand with the fourth finger in the left to work. It's about actually hearing what it is supposed to sound like. So you can, you can sort of take them into a domain they're not ready to do themselves yet yeah. by providing that. And then they actually hear the holistic thing, something that's bigger than the part they're actually playing. You know, so I do that a lot, uh, yeah. even even with sort of NRSN students. You know, mm, and and I in your piano black and white book, I really love your um, finger pilates, um, <laughs> and and I I think that is a really important thing with beginner adult learners that mm. you are taking them off the piano. I do quite a lot of work on the piano lid, and we choreograph the fingers. <laughs> So you're taking away another sense so yeah. that they can actually feel that because it's it it's not the same for an adult learner. It can be harder to make those brain connections to yeah. make that that flexibility there. Um, mm. And um, would you like to demonstrate one of your, oh, your yeah. finger pilates? Well, the, I mean, first of all, the point of this really is to encourage the adult learner to be seeing that it's not about playing the piano isn't about strength so much as flexibility and yeah. one of the things that happens to all people when they get older is that they lose that mobility and flexibility yeah, yeah. might retain quite a lot of their strength you know you might still be able to lift the lawnmower from the garage to the garden but can you can you bend down and stand up as easily as you once did you yeah. know can you can your fingers move in, in, a, in a smooth, uncluttered way, just as they might have done when you were young. We can't make these assumptions about old people. So uh, encouraging mobility and, and, and a, f a fluent um, kind of vocabulary, if you like, with the, with the fingers is a really important thing. So I, what I've done in this new book is to, is to dot about the book, it's sort of punctuated with little exercises that I found useful for myself, um, but also for adults, so stretching between, say, the thumb and the and the and the, and the yeah. second finger, but also between the second and the fifth finger, totally. um, and using the piano as a way of not as a piece of gymnastic equipment, but as a means of of sort of locating what your stretches are. Okay, totally. never, never hurting your hands, never risking any kind of damage. Always playing within a, a comfortable, safe environment, but nevertheless enjoying that feeling of taking yourself just a molecule away from what is currently doable for you. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. that's how you actually keep the thing moving along. So it's, it, it's, it's partly about finding ways that your particular hand shape can benefit from. I mean, and, and then making the most of those exercises, just as you would if you went to the gym, you might find that sit-ups are out of bounds for you, but certain bar work or, or dumbbell work is, is very useful. So I've kind of threaded a lot of these things in the book in a way of encouraging yeah. you. And, and the other thing is, if a student is is basically, I mean, I know with my adult stu students, they can get very, very frustrated, you know, mm. that they're, that with the coordination, they're finding it difficult. Actually taking them off the piano and doing those kind of exercises can actually be a real relief, can't it, Mark? Mm. You know, to, to, to create that little bit of space mm. um, to, to, to help them with that. And uh, we've got another listener who's um, 
asked about how we bring in playing by ear mm -hmm. and also about improvisation. Mm -hmm. um, I tend to do it without even saying it is, <laughs> sneak it in. Um, yeah. Do you do the same thing? Yeah, I, I suppose I do. I mean, the same way as oral, I think is best sort of um, it, writing in the slipstream of other things rather than being a, a, a turning point in the lesson. We're just, we're going to do oral now. We're going to do yeah. some reading. Um, when, when you were talking about playing by ear, um, w everything we do is playing by ear, actually, whether yeah. we're using a score or not. That, that's the first thing to try and recognise. Um, the score is merely a means of, of allowing someone else's notation to filter through into your fingers so that you don't have to memorize it. But ultimately, the ear is always playing an important part in what you're doing. Yeah. I mean, that's the simplest way of, of doing that, surely, is the, the simplest call and response things with get, getting an adult to sit at the top or bottom of the piano with their second finger on a, on a G or something, and, and then just playing um, rhythmic, um, echoes. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. I'm, I'm just going to I'm just going to hop in here, folks. I can tell yeah. you, you know, you can just you, just wanted to give you a little bit of feedback because everybody's loving it here. Um, and going back to the repertoire you were mentioning, mm -hmm. Julie has given a great shout out for the Bartok, which I'm absolutely mm -hmm. with her on that one. I think the Microcosmos is 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 fabulous books. Um, but I love this idea, Mark, that you were saying about. And, and Karen about playing duets, you know, because together you are so much more the greater mm -hmm. than the, the sum of a single yeah. part, aren't you? And it's really important, I think you'll put, you both agree, that students have a feeling, adult students and children, get a feeling of making music right, yeah. from, the, right from the very start. So fantastic. Yeah. Um, now, somebody, yeah, so Gavin's asked about playing by ear. Um, somebody here has, uh, has, has recommended, Rosa has, has said playing by ear, of course, by Lucinda yeah, Young is, yeah. is a really good um, systematic way of, of doing that. Um, and, and I've forgotten how to say your name again. Um, Ma Marie with a V, Mavi, Mavi says, uh, people, kids, uh, kids and adults love to improvise, she says. So she, yeah. I think she probably just just does it indeed. So and I just love this idea, Mark, of finger Pilates. Having just I just said, having just got back from Pilates myself this morning and feeling all, you know, toned ish kind of, you know, <laughs> finger Pilates. Love that idea. Um, Claude is saying, can you just remind us of the name of your adult tutor books that are coming out or your adult books that are coming out, Mark? Um, it's just one book and it's called The Piano in Black and White. Okay, The Piano in um, Black and White. And that's Favourite Music and that will be out, um, well, for, for Christmas. So okay. we're, 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 we're still in, in, you know, engaged in, in, in sorting out. Um, Fantastic. All of the various elements that come into what's going to be really quite a, a, a sort of big book with lots of different media in there. Yeah. Um, okay. Okay. Lovely. I shall leave you. I shall leave you alone again. I just thought I'd hop in with yeah. a few <laughs> questions. You. Okay, all right, back over to you. Um, I think we we probably should talk now, Mark, about sort of the returning adults mm -hmm. and yeah. um, and you know what we sort of developed in the advanced pianist and and we why we did it in a particular yeah, sure. way. Yeah. Um, so when we've got an adult returning you are actually sort of dealing with a lot of their back history, aren't you? Mm. Um, their, their previous yeah. sort of experience. And, and one thing that I sort of deal with a lot with these returning um, adults is this idea of interpretation mm. and, and how to interpret music and wanting to have much, much more detail on that. Now, I, you know... I, I have done, um, with the piano trainer, I've got three um, co-authors. And when um, Faber were talking to me about doing these advanced books, I did actually say to them, look, I am not willing to do these on my own. I need to have a concert pianist, an expert performer, somebody who can talk about that, that performance aspect from first-hand experience on a very, very regular basis. And I think what you did bring to the books, which I just was unable to do, was 
that really exciting, expressive, um, original interpretation um, ideas. And so within the books, it does, you know, on, on virtually all of the repertoire, doesn't it, Mark? It, it sort of, get, you come in as the concert pianist, don't you? Like you're at the piano, you know, there with them, giving mm. them different hints and tips. Um, yeah. And and with adult learners, we we felt it was really important to give that more sort of in-depth analysis, didn't we? Yeah, and also I think just having a different voice in the room, not exactly a fly on the wall, but a sort of speaking fly on the wall um, is quite useful because then you get a different perspective um, rather than the same voice trying to take on a different tangent into the, into the music. Because you've got what's on the page, you've got the black stuff on the page, you've got the, the kind of history of the composers and the instruments they were writing for and, and so on. Um, but then what, is, what does that all actually add up to? You know, uh, that, it's all very well giving those sorts of facts to an adult yeah. or, or to a teenager um, and, and expecting them to sort of join the dots up. But actually you as a teacher need to be able to say, well, what does this mean then? What, what are the questions that are still open for us to discuss? For example, dynamics and articulation and tempo in a Baroque piece. You know, what's the bandwidth of acceptability here? We, we know that the, the, there were the keyboards of the day, such as the harpsichord and the clavichord and so on, but, mm -hmm. and they had what we might think of as limitations uh, compared with the 21st century. Um, but to what extent does that allow us to engage in battle with it, if you like, and impose yeah. our own interpretive ideas? Those sorts of things are not factual, they're subjective. So yeah. how do you make, how do you make the, the, the most of the facts that you've got? And that really was my role, I think, within the yeah. to be yeah. constantly saying, you could think of it like this, you could think of it like that, rather than saying, that means you can't do this, you can't do that. It's not about shutting down no. possibilities, it's about opening them up but yeah. giving you a framework within which to make those decisions. Yeah. The, the other thing that we did um, was we, we thought a lot about pacing mm. because most advanced books have, the students never get through them. Mm. So in the grade six plus book, um, it's got sort of, well, it's got even grade three material in it, um, mm. sort, of, sort of reading rooms. There's this thing called the reading room. Mm. Um, and so I know we've, we've had some questions about limited mobility and, and, um, from, and, a, and a lovely response from somebody about using music that provides joy. And I think that is very, very important. I think you need to find music as well that can sound very impressive, but is very easy to play. You know, and I mean, I do have certain pieces where that is the case. And in fact, there is some actually in the Advanced Pianist, which are very, very playable repertoire. Um, and, you know, and then the harder stuff, you know, it might be that the, the student wasn't able to do that at that point. But there's material there that they can get through more easily and quickly. Yeah. And also, also, it's about... Um, the idea of consolidation because um, really? you know if, if you go to karate classes you think of I've got to go up the next belt um, and the, 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 there can be that sort of mentality of yeah. I'm, I'm only sort of spending my time fruitfully if I'm pursuing the next level up a golfer wants to get his handicap down from 18 to 17 to 16 there's a sort of um, yeah. you never get to the end kind of thing even when you become a, a sort of you know low handicap player you're, you're wanting to become a scratch golfer and so on at what point do we just sort of enjoy what we've already built the consolidation aspect and that means going back a step or even two or three yeah you totally know. don't you think yeah. i mean and i mean that's why i think that personally a grade eight player should be able to play a really beautiful performance of a grade four piece you know. Yeah, well, well we, don't, we don't tend to indulge that very much. We tend to think, well, what's next then? Well, next actually perhaps is, is going back and, and being able to play something with no technical difficulties now because it's well within you and really giving a polished performance of something like that. 
you know? Totally. And, and also, um, looking at, I know Andrew Eels in his Piano Deo talks about active repertoire. I'm a strong believer in keeping some pieces with all my learners yeah. in the bag. So that, you know, it's pieces of music that they could perform at concert, concerts yeah. at any point. Um, yeah. But also coming back to those materials, and I even have some videos of where they might have played it um, as a, a sort of a nine-year-old. And then we revisit at 13 and mm -hmm. they can see the different level of interpretation. And I think I think that's that's very very important. Um, the advanced pianist starts actually at, at grade six um, onwards, but the piano tra trainer series starts at post grade one, um, and the foundation pianist is sort of grade one plus to three. Then the intermediates are three to five, and then these books are six to eight. Um, but I. I, I think you're absolutely right. We we do need to give our students the opportunity to see their own musical journeys, don't we? You know, where they've come from, consolidate and and look at, you know, the improvement in how their legato play, how their cantabile, their pedaling, et cetera, et cetera. We've had some things about Christopher Norton's music. Yes, I use Christopher Norton's material a lot. I particularly like um, his styles. I think he's got a styles book that I use um, quite a bit. Um, I used uh, Christopher Norton when I first started teaching um, in the 80s, um, late 80s or early 90s. I remember some of the, the first set of micro jazz coming out. It was an absolute revelation for me. Um, it, was, yeah. it was lovely. And I found that the, um, the pupils really responded to it, um, not just. Um, younger pupils but adults as well because it's a way into that you know yeah potted, potted jazz is essentially what you're saying isn't it small version yeah. of jazz um and with all and that's a very skillful thing to do in my opinion to be able to capture the essence of something which is as complicated and as far reaching as something like jazz but put it in a form which is actually accessible um yeah. and that's essentially with these two books i mean what we've been trying to do actually is to get the, the essence of a lot of these different styles into pieces that are accessible so that um, you come away with knowing a little bit more about the romantic period, the Baroque period, whatever, than you once did via the music, via the exercises, via the theoretical aspects of it, which of course, if you don't have, you're always going to be sort of, you know, a lot of this black stuff on the page is going to be a mystery to you. So that, that was really one of our ways of trying to embrace all these things, wasn't it? which is why it works yeah. almost like a piano tutor book which you might have for a beginner right up to somebody at you know grade eight level yeah know, i mean systems there isn't it really yeah the, i mean i think the the other thing that we did too mark was um so the books are split into five mm. um categories aren't they so we've got sort of um early music, Baroque, um, we've got the, you know, the classical, the romantic mm. and the um, 20th century. However, yeah. we've got a different category in there, haven't we? <laughs> we are, but yeah, we've come up with this other area called the bridge um, mm. because there's quite a lot of confusion about interpretation between the classical and romantic periods. Mm. Um, and we, we wanted to sort of, sort of move them along didn't we can can you talk a little bit about what was happening with the piano because i yeah. think this was what we did sort of talk about in the book as well didn't we that's really important yeah, yeah i think it's, it's important to always to know a little bit about the keyboards of the day not because you're turning yourself into a, a historian or because you're going to have to write an essay about it but simply because if you know what the keyboard was that a particular composer is writing for you then have some greater insight into why the dynamics were written the way they were, why um, the, the notes in the right hand never seem to go higher than an F or something, um, why the pedal markings are either not there or they don't seem to apply very well on the modern instrument. Those yeah. sorts of things are really important to know, not because you're playing on one of those older instruments, um, you're playing on whatever you've got in front of you, um, but so it sets the context, it gets the oils the 
the, the wheels in your mind of how you were actually thinking about what you're doing. With the bridge period, I think the, the interesting thing is to know that it's not just a bridge period in terms of what, what's being written for the, for the piano, but also it's a bridge for the instruments themselves. You know, much of the, of the fruitful history of what we know to be the modern piano took place within a, what you could say is a sort of 50 year period from seven, you know, the, the late um, 18th century right up until about 1830. It all kind of happened in that 50 year period really. And you could compress it right down actually to an even tighter bandwidth of maybe 17, 18, 90 to about 18, 10, 20. Yeah. That's when a lot of that happened. And we still didn't have the iron framed piano as we yeah. know. And that's the, that was the game changer. That was when we suddenly had all of the, the, the extra capacity for um, tension within the strings and so on. Yeah. And so we're, we're talking about 1830, 1840 before this. So that's outside of the bridge period. Yeah. But those composers that were living in the cusp of that period um, were also living with the cusp of the instrument and how it was ev evolving. And that's the really important thing. You know, you put yourself in the mind of the composer having to write for an instrument which is changing almost by the year. You know, it's a different instrument now. Yeah, and, and we talked about the difference between the piano forte and the forte mm. piano, didn't we, yeah. Mark? Yeah, well, exactly, which is a very crucial difference. We tend to sort of interchange those terms as though they mean the same thing. And yeah. they're not the same thing. The piano forte is the English instrument, um, the London instrument. The sort of instrument that was being developed by Clementi, who, who earned more money from, from building pianos than he ever did from writing piano pieces. Um, and then you've got the Viennese model, the Mozart uh, the piano of, of the same time, yeah. which is subtly different, but in, in important ways. And so you've got this kind of parallel route moving um, development between the, the forte piano and the piano forte. Um, and even though they were aware of each other's existence, if you like, there were different priorities involved in the building of the instrument and therefore the piano music that was written for those two instruments. So that explains yeah. you get tremolos in Beethoven uh, and Clementi, but you get much more of the kind of sh what I call crystal chandelier writing in the right hand in Mozart with, with lots yeah. of sparkling runs and things and Alberti basses and so on, because that suits the Viennese instrument better. So we go into a lot of depth, don't we, in both of those books. Um, about how to yeah. bring that into effect. Yeah, and, and, and actually, um, I was, before we came on, I was telling, talking to Sally about um, visiting Salzburg over the mm. summer. So I was very lucky to go to Salzburg and I actually went into Mozart's house and I saw Mozart's piano. Right. And, you know, and when you look at the instrument, you realise actually the keyboard's so much smaller. <laughs> Mm. you know yeah. and the actual size of the keys you know it's it's a smaller instrument um and and so that you know translates into you know the amount of movement of mm. the hand that would have been expected yeah. to play it yeah um, but it, also, it also begs the question though it, to, to what extent do you need to try and make the modern piano sound like that instrument? You know, I think the mistake That's people make right. is that they, they, they learn a few facts about the, the, the Viennese forte piano and they think, now what am I supposed to do with these facts? Um, you know, I'm, I'm, does that mean I've got to try and make the modern piano sound a bit like a, a, a forte piano? And actually the answer to that, you know, if it's got to be a yes or a no, is definitely a no in my opinion. It just means that what we have to try to do is, is look at the priorities and the, and the musical effect that was underneath all of those notes and try and yeah. valid, validly reproduce those on the modern piano. You cannot make a modern piano sound like a harpsichord. Nobody can, you know, no. any no. more than you can make a harpsichord sound like a piano. You can't do it. No, no. but the no. adult learner likes to know about these things yeah. in my experience. In that you know they they want to know about the full picture i mean i i even talk about architecture um literature art of the same period um and i find you know these adult learners that are returning to me you know like sue done her grade five in the 1950s you know they want to know those facts yeah. um and i and i think it it is it, it gives us a, a real sort of opportunity to treat to teach in a really holistic way you know about yeah. the arts really yeah um, 
absolutely. I mean, don't you think also, if you're talking about the differences between children and adults, how they learn, if you, you give a, a digital camera to a, a 14 year old um, and on Christmas day, and they'll open it up and they won't look at any of the manuals or they won't go online and check how things should be done. They'll stick the batteries in and they'll flip around and within five minutes they're walking around the garden taking photographs of the roses. You give that same camera to somebody in their 50s or 60s and they might take that approach but on the whole I think they'll take a different approach. They'll do, yeah. they'll, 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 they'll get the manual out and they'll get their highlighter pen out and they'll, they'll, they'll punch holes in it and stick it into a lever art file and you know, certainly when my dad bought his last camera, he's a bit older than 50, or, you know, he's in his 80s. Um, but, you know, he literally spent two weeks making this lever arch file of all of the helps that he could find before he switched the camera on, right? Now, I think that tells us a lot about how an adult, rather than a young person, is going to approach learning the piano. They're going to be happier to know the history and the theory of it than a child that, would, that you know? Yeah, I think I've caused a bit of confusion and when I've explained the book, so I, I'm just going to clarify yeah. this for, for, one, for one listener. So there's two books in the um, Advanced um, yeah. Pianist, which is part of the overall Piano Trainer series. How it's actually structured is there's five different sections in the book around mm -hmm. the musical periods yeah. but within those sections there's also technical gyms activities musicianship mm -hmm. repertoire reading rooms which are sort of like quick studies and then there's the composer gallery where mm -hmm. we feature a classical composer and we have um well two but mainly three or four pieces of music well three generally pieces by that composer of all different levels from easy to hard so it's the books themselves that are split into five different sections around the musical periods with this extra bridge one put in there um, yeah. with those different categories but they're not really levels they're, no. they're different categories of 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 embracing all the materials we've been talking about so it's not levels of of of, um, of, of understanding as it as it were that's yeah. with by the individual books of course you know? yeah yeah uh, but um, um, it's been fascinating putting these books together hasn't it because we've been forced to try to to see the learning process not just from a, a writer's point of view or a teacher's point of view but how an adult actually or a young young adult somebody in their late teens perhaps might actually be wanting to to learn this stuff you know what are the yeah. questions they ask what are the things that they're most confused by what are the things that they find most enjoyable that you can tap into and that will keep yeah. them motivated um yeah. and ultimately what's going to steer them forward and give them that rounded sort of approach yeah. um, you know because they don't necessarily an adult won't necessarily know what they need to know no uh, well, well not that's that's right um and you know we, we spent a lot of time discussing things didn't we just as you know um i always think when i'm writing i need to honor my readers you know and and i think that it was about putting in there something that you know would sort of inform but also bring huge pleasure and joy as well yeah well exactly and we've got some quite light pieces there's a couple of jazzy things in yeah. there there's all sorts of um little sort of extra bits that you can put on your christmas tree to to, to pretty it up not just the fundamentals um, because you need and you you were quite right i'm sure karen is saying all the way through this that we need to have these extra elements to deviate from you can't just have your teacher with a capital t sort of root through you know um you know, a field march through the learning process. You've yeah. got to have these tangential bits that you can add on, the, the, the fun bits, the lighthearted bits, the deviation points um, yeah. that, that remind you you're a kind of flexible human being, you know, not just sort of rigidly going through the process. Because you're not teaching to do an exam necessarily, you're teaching to, to produce a better pianist. Yeah. And, and the better the player you are, <laughs> the more you enjoy what you play yeah um we've we've just been asked about um some previews we will go to faber and ask for some sample pages specifically for piano curious piano teachers we will get that sorted for you 
fantastic thank yeah. you thank you both so much um i know there's there's more to come yet but i'm i'm just going to hop in with a couple of questions that we had uh from from jane um I, I think one of the things I love about all the piano trainer books is that they kind of provide teachers with a bit of a system, don't they, for how to go from one place to another, which people can get a bit stuck on somehow. And it seems to me that that could also help to be provide an answer for this, um, how to deal sensitively with somebody who believes they are more advanced <laughs> than they really are, which is the question that we've had from Jane. Uh, I don't know what your thoughts are, are about that, either of you. Mm. Um, it's a very common one this and it's one of those elephants in the room um, because you know you, you get somebody who comes along who who thinks they're a certain level um, and and it might be that they once were in the sense that they got their grade seven 30 years ago but that doesn't mean they're grade seven now mm. because 30 years has passed mm. uh, things have changed they haven't kept up their playing so for them it's entirely logical to, to do grade eight, isn't it? I mean, I did grade seven before, why wouldn't I want to do grade eight now? Um, but they're actually, they're grade seven going on grade two, you know? So it, the important thing is to take them from where they are at rather than where they would like to be. We would all like to be able to just simply sort of march on. Um, so finding a way to not take the air out of their balloon, but give them the sense that they are actually going to enjoy what they're doing next without necessarily playing the game or encouraging them um, to, to, to go upwards all the time. You know, it's not an insult on their manhood because you take them back a couple of stages. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's a really important thing to do. And that's part of that coffee shop discussion you can have that I was talking about at the beginning where you, you actually sort of agree some sort of common ground on this and you might not have heard them play yet, so it's kind of difficult to do that. But if you say to them, look, you know, just because you love Rachmaninoff and Rachmaninoff was the reason you wanted to learn the piano doesn't necessarily mean that next Tuesday when you come along for your lesson, we'll be looking at Rachmaninoff. You know, it doesn't necessarily mean that. Um, and there, there's, but there are lots and lots of pieces by other composers that have some of the elements of Rachmaninoff that are a, quite a lot easier than that that will give you a more immediate feedback into that. And I think that's, that's the way that you kind of square the circle because you don't want to, you know, rain on their parade, as I say, you want, you want to, to give them, um, you know, some um, sense that, that they're, they're going to be able to achieve this. Um, but the time scale is sometimes so great that they'll, they'll, they'll have given up before they get to that point, unless you can find some alternatives it will be placed in you know in the more immediate future don't you think Karen do you think that's the way yeah you know? yeah I mean I my my use is always by a repertoire I have material that I know that most students will absolutely love and I and I'll say you know um have a listen to this because I think you know you'll play it really well <laughs> they've, they've no idea what great it is um yeah. but 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 then you know they they will sort of go for it um and because they love it and so and, that that's what i do and it's also part of this consolidation thing you know just if you can encourage people right from the earliest levels that whatever level they're at they should be consolidating at half that level then that's a mentality they carry on forever more i mean you know if i was in charge of, of designing a new uh, high level performance diploma I'd be quite tempted to encourage uh, people to play really quite a simple piece. Yeah. I, I, I would say, okay, you can play the Liszt Sonata, um, but can you play the Raindrop Prelude? Okay. And because I want to, I want to know that you're caring about every note, that you really understand about the texture and the shape of this piece. You know, bring all of that massive musical skill set that you've got to this rather shorter piece that only lasts five minutes, whatever it is. You know, and, and because we don't do enough of that as teachers, we think, well, you can play this piece, let's move to the next level. We should be thinking in terms of the quality of your playing rather than the difficulty level of the piece that you're learning. And yeah. would, I, I love that idea, actually, Mark. And would you say that quite often people crash around with the hard pieces and actually they, <laughs> they hide, you know, they, they actually can never quite get to the musical part of it because they're so busy 
managing the technique the technical yeah. aspects of it you know yeah. absolutely the sort of running around a minefield yeah, yeah, yeah. to avoid all yeah. these little explosions yeah. going on yeah yeah and, and you were itching to get in there and say oh how about the balance between the hands there well i can't hear the tune you think <laughs> the tune, we're, we're, we're 10 lessons away from even being able to play the notes of the tune let alone do anything shapely with it you know it, it's a bit of a symptom of our society though isn't it and and i think as piano teachers we do have a an ability to shift their thinking a little bit away from this idea that you've got to go better 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 up 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 you know, as pianists, we've got so much repertoire that is available to us. You know, as Karen was saying, we all have or should start to develop, you know, the, the, the repertoire we know is absolutely going to work and just switch them on at that one moment. Yeah. Anyhow, let's just see what else. Um, yeah. Theory, I think the ABRSM's theory app's very good, Sally. You were yeah. about theory. I think that their app is, is very good. I use that a lot with adults. Mm yeah um rose is suggesting the piece of wheat by paul harris as well there yeah. um and yeah, yeah lo lots of people really uh ag agreeing here about yeah maybe get them playing something easier but that very very beautifully and sensitively um yeah yeah, yeah. that's yeah. Really important all of that isn't it really yeah it is uh, it is you know because that, that's how you can sustain them in the longer run um, you know, you want them to enjoy what they're playing. Mm. They're entitled to love Rachmaninoff if they want to love Rachmaninoff. So mm. I'm not knocking that as an ambition. We've all got ambitions. There are pieces that I know I will never play because mm. I don't really have the facility to get around them. That doesn't stop me from wanting <laughs> to have the ambition to play those pieces and occasionally flicking through the plate and playing it. Why not? Um, it's just that part of your job as a teacher is to like your GP, give you advice that's going to be best for your piano health. You, 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 you know, you're ducking for your, for your responsibility as a teacher if you don't take these difficult topics and actually deal with them head on. If you've got somebody who's playing a piece that is five grades too hard for them, then they're, they're, they're going to be learning all kinds of, of poor techniques. They're, they're not going to be ever be able to penetrate the musical aspect of it. They might be doing themselves physical harm and perhaps more important than that even is that they're likely to give up because they're not ever going to make the ground that they want to get. So you're, you as a teacher have to bring your baggage of experiences to that and say, in your best interests, I really advocate that you look at this different piece, which will yeah. tick lots of your musical boxes and technical ones but actually it's going to be more doable. And in six weeks time, I promise you, if you go and practice that properly, you will be able to play that piece. Yeah. You know, yeah. as a teacher, yeah. you have that wealth of experience, you can give them that advice. I, uh, again, I love that idea, you know, um, that part of your job, what you've just said, part of your job as, as a teacher is to give people that advice. And to all you teachers out there, you have to step up to that role. Yeah, mm. Don't be afraid, don't be shy. That's your job, that's why they're paying you. Would you agree, mm. Karen? Yeah, totally. Absolutely. And I think I think the thing is that um, we have to have courage as teachers, don't we? Mm. Courage is really important um, mm. and and be true to our values as a teacher as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, ab absolutely. I love I love those ideas that we have to have courage, we have to be truthful, we have to really stick to our values and know what we stand for, I think. Yeah. I know it's nearly, or just gone, I think 12 o'clock, and um, it's been a fascinating conversation from both of you, and I know a lot of people are saying, oh yes, I've got the books, or um, I'm just about to go and get the books, um, and indeed looking forward to Mark's book as well coming out just before Christmas, that's, that's one for the Christmas list, possibly. Um, any, any final thoughts from both of you about teaching adults before we wrap up for today? Um, I think it's to seeing it as a real privilege um, because, you know, sometimes it's, it's been a lifelong um, ambition for that person to actually learn the piano or come back to the piano. And I always think, I'm very privileged to actually work with you um, and you know I, I, I had a student that did her grade eight at 70 <laughs> and you know I think you know it, it it's also a huge amount of fun as well I, I love the variety of working with adults but it's different 
And I think we have to treat it differently too. And they are all complete individuals on their own journey. Yeah. I, I personally think that with adults using lots of humour, um, lots of metaphors for things is very useful because um, they've got they've got all kinds of skills that they use in their professional lives. That just because yeah. they're beginner pianists doesn't mean they're beginner adults. That they're, they're they're very accomplished accountants or surveyors or whatever. They've got a lot of of um, you know of, of intelligence and and intellect and sophistication that they bring to the learning of of the things that they've done well at in their lives. And so you can you can tap into that as a teacher by by encouraging them to see parallels in whatever world they actually inhabit and the world that you're helping them to inhabit as, as a musician and i think that's something i use a lot and as i say i think fun is a great way of of you know introducing a bit of levity into a lesson as yeah. a way of, of lightening the load a little bit because they're getting a bit tense um they're struggling with this left hand fingering you, you've been trying to give them um and just by sort of making light of it, not not sort of taking the mickey out of, of the situation, yeah. but simply actually kind of trying to sort of relax the pace a little bit and, and, and move on to a more humorous domain is actually a very useful thing. It happens with kids as well, of course, yeah. uh, particularly with adults, you need to be able to do that. Mm. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, I think those are two two great uh, ideas to to leave us with, and uh, I'd just like to say a really big thank you on behalf of the Curious Piano Teachers for coming and sharing your wealth of expertise with us, both Karen and Mark. Um, I know everybody who's here has has much enjoyed themselves. Yeah, we're getting you know really thank you for being really inspiring and encouraging. Somebody else came in with some super ideas from Debbie as well. Um, uh, and Marion, thank you so much. Very helpful, especially to give correct advice, not grade seven when they are grade two. I need to be bold. Yes, Marion, be bold, <laughs> be bold. Um, so thank you to everybody who's come along and uh, and for joining. Well, thank you for having us. Thank That's, you. Yeah. <laughs> our pleasure and um i hope you all have a fantastic week ahead and really feel um buoyed up by all these ideas that have been shared with our two experts karen marshall and mark tanner thank you both so much thank you thanks for having me thank, thank you. you okay everybody bye for now happy teaching have a good week thank you bye